Hello everyone, uh, welcome to ECMATH. How are you guys doing? Uh, today we're going to talk about the law of cosines, and in particular, we're going to talk about the ambiguous case for law of cosines. So if you've been solving triangles uh, using the laws of sine and cosines, then you know that solving means that usually you get three parts of the triangle and you're finding the other three parts of the triangle. So maybe you're given some combination of sides and angles, maybe just sides, maybe just angles, and you have to find everything that's missing. Um, now, it would be really nice if we could get any three uh, things of these triangles and find the others, but there's a couple sort of complications. One complication that you might immediately come up with is, say you only got three angles, that's three parts of the triangle, but you would not be able to find all the sides because the three angles don't determine a unique triangle, right? There's only, uh, there's as many triangles as you want. So that's one of the cases, that's kind of the easiest. Um, and I thought, before we get into the case that is ambiguous, let's go through the, the cases that do determine a unique triangle and kind of explain why these do create a unique triangle so that maybe when we get to the ambiguous case, it can make more sense. Um, so say that I was given three sides of 10, four, and eight centimeters. 10, four, eight. Now, if you imagine this being made out of sticks uh, or rods or, or anything, um, this would be completely rigid. There'd be no way that I could pick up this eight uh, centimeter side, pick up a side, and move it around in such a way that it made a different triangle. I mean, I guess the worst I could do would be maybe uh, pick up the 10 and pick up the four. But oh look, I've just like rotated the triangle. So that kind of ends up being the same triangle. Um, uh, you know, so it would have the same angles as before. So there's nothing here that uh, prevents the triangle or lets the triangle flex it. It's it totally rigid. So three sides uh, is not an ambiguous case. Uh, I would solve this using the law of cosines uh, to find it, uh, one of the angles. Uh, there is some complication in a later video about which angle you should find first in here. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. If you have three sides, there is potential for complication, uh, but we're gonna come to that at a later time. Um, this is also an example. If you remember your geometry, you, you kind of thought about geometry as you're doing this. This is an example of side, side, side. Now we used to call these congruence theorems. If you were proving th some things, you would show, you know, you might know that, uh, you know, if you had these three and then another triangle over here that had the same three markings, then you could say those triangles were congruent because they had matching sides. Well, this is kind of the algebraic version of side, side, side. You have three sides, so that means that there's only one triangle that has this thing and you can find the angles. Uh, all right, well, we already said if you're given three angles that that would not be enough information because you could have any sort of side length uh, you want. But say that I was given three angles and a side. So I was given a 100 degree angle. I was given a 70 degree angle. And I was given a 10 degree angle. And this is not quite to scale, but work with me here. And I was also maybe told, so right here, this triangle could of course be any size I want, which is part of the problem. But say that the problem also told me that between the 10 and 70 is fixed at five centimeters. That is, that's not changing. Then this would definitely count as a unique triangle because the move that I was trying to do, if I do this now, I'm stretching that side that was listed at five centimeters and I can still do it on one note here, but it's not allowed, it shouldn't be allowed. Uh, that would change the, the side length when I stretch it up like that. Um, also, uh, so I guess if we wanted to write this as a congruence theorem, we could write it as like angle, side, angle, angle. Now, obviously you don't need three angles. If I had not told you that that was 100, you could just do 180 minus 10 minus 70 and calculate that that was 100. So you don't need these three angles. All you really need is two, uh, then you could find a third. So technically then this gives you good old angle, side, angle and also angle, angle, side, and also side, angle, angle, and all of those kind of congruence theorems where you have two angles and one side. Uh, this is that case here. And here, again, no ambiguity. Everything works nicely. Use the law of sines or cosines as you see fit. Um, probably here, um, it's easier to use the law of sines 
because you're always going to have like some kind of ratio of a side and its opposite. So law of sines is a really nice law to use. Uh, and then you can find the missing sides. Or that would be the missing side. Um, another case that you might run into is say that you're given two sides and the included angle. So included means specifically in between. So this is uh, correlates to side, angle, side, if you're thinking about congruence theorems. And that would look something like this. This also denotes a completely unique triangle because these three items you can imagine like sticking your fingers out in some configuration and connecting the last side. There's no other way that I'm going to be able to connect this last side. Everything else is rigid here. Oh, I could miss. As long as you go with the correct angle, you're going to connect that side with the, the, the last side, the missing side. Uh, right, so whatever side that is, you call it C and, and you would solve for it. Um, this one I'd probably use the law of cosines uh, because I have two sides at an angle and I'm missing that opposite side. So that's a good situation to use law of cosines. So that's not the ambiguous case. Here is what I'm going to call the flexible case and often is called the ambiguous case. And that's if you're given two sides and an angle that's not included between them. Uh, so this is actually kind of a challenge to draw I and mean, draw it sort of to scale because the first thing I'm going to draw is a 30 degree angle, but I don't know the sides that are around it. So for example, I don't know how long that side is. So I'm just going to draw this side out here as like a dotted line because this length is as yet unknown. Then I'm going to say, all right, we'll go 30 degrees up. That looks like roughly 30 degrees. Now this side, I'm going to say, this is the one that I do know. I'm going to say this is the 10 cm side. Uh, let's make it a little longer just because. Uh, now I'm going to draw the 8 cm side. So 8 cm side looks like it could it has to be a little bit shorter than the 10, so it looks like it could be somewhere right around here. Now uh, at this time you might be saying, all right, Mr. X, there's a triangle. You have a side ratio, so you can do like sine of 30 over 8 equals sine of we'll call it question mark over 10 and start solving for angle question mark. But there's a problem. When I drew this red side, I put it in the first place that I thought I could put it. But can you see, take a look at this. Can you see another place where that red side could have been? We're drawing it to scale. Could it not have also been drawn right here? Notice how those two triangles would fit in, like, those two red sides would fit. And since we weren't given this angle, right, that was like a still an unknown angle. There's no information in the givens to tell us which of those two sides we need to, to approach or need to solve for. And another way to think about this is that this could be the center of a circle. This red side could lie anywhere on a circle. And there are two spots on that circle where it would be successfully able to complete the triangle. So that's why this is called the ambiguous case. Uh, I took a second to redraw things here. It's why it's called the ambiguous case is because there's multiple triangles that can potentially be drawn. If you think about two sides and a not included angle, uh, then that you know would be written in a congruence theorem as SSA, uh, or if you reverse it backwards, it is uh, a naughty word. And that's one of those ones that we know is not a congruence theorem. Now, you might have learned in geometry that it's not a congruence theorem uh, just because it's bad or because it says a bad word. Well, that's stupid. The reason it's not a congruence theorem is because of this picture right here, that we can create multiple triangles from uh, those two givens informations. Now, it's not such a bad congruence theorem, though. And here's what I mean by that. I'm not able to create like infinitely many triangles, right? There's lots of problems where there's no solutions because there's infinitely many solutions. This is a situation where there's two solutions. And so in a situation where there's two solutions, I don't know, why don't we just find both? Uh, and so here's how we're going to do that. I made this a little larger here. I'm just going to approach this with some geometry. Uh, I'm going to say sine of 30 over 8 
is equal to sine of x over 10. And so I'm going to find angle x. Now, I don't actually know which angle x I'm going to find. I'm going to maybe call this x1 and x2. But let's just like do some stuff in our calculator and see what our calculator thinks. So sine of 30, remember your unit circle, that's actually 1 half. So we have 1 half over 8 equals sine x over 10. Uh, so this ends up being 1 16th, right? Uh, so then we have multiplied by 10, so we get 10 16th will equal sine x. And you can take our calculator. Make sure you're in degree mode. Oh, look, that needs to be. And we could just do something like arc sine, sine inverse of 10 over 16. We get about 38.682. degrees. So I did right sine inverse of both sides here to solve for x. Now let's look at the picture. Um, I am at this point, I did three decimal places because that's what you should be using. I am at this point going to round this to 38.7 uh, just for the purpose of this video. Well that looks like x1 looks like it's an obtuse angle. x2 though that looks like it's an acute angle. So I must have solved for x2 there. So I'm going to pencil that in. When you're solving with these triangles and you know you're in an ambiguous case and you use your law of sines, which is what you'll always use because of how you're given the givens, you're always going to end up finding this angle right here first. Now, let's take some information and find x1. I'm just making it smaller over there. Now, there's one cool fact about this triangle. Notice how this sides are 8 centimeters and 8 centimeters, which means that the triangle I'm about to highlight is an isosceles triangle. So if that's 38.7, then this angle also must be 38.7, which means x1 must be 180 minus 38.7. or about 141.3. So we're actually able to find both possible angles for x down there. Now, let's say I'm up here, I'm trying to find the last angle of the triangle. Well, we'll call this one y1, and we'll call this one y2. Uh, I just have to separate these triangles out and kind of draw them separately. So let's do that. So we'll say, triangle number one and triangle number two uh, has sides of 10, 8, and 10, 8, angles are 30, 30, but triangle one has a 38.7 and triangle two has a 141.3. Then to find this y1 and y2, let's just do 90 uh, or 180 Ooh. minus 30 minus, I'll find uh, that one first. So that means that that y1 has to be 8.7 degrees. And I'll do 180 minus 30 minus 38.7 and get 111.3 degrees. Uh, now, in this case, it happened that those angles in triangle one were larger than 90. Um, it doesn't have to be. You can end up with two different kind of acute triangle angles down in there. And then we need to find the last side. Let's call it, you know, uh, S2 and S1. Well, how do I find it? Um, we can do the law of sines again because I now know angles y1 and y2. So let's find uh, the longest side in triangle 2 first. So then I'll set up uh, sine of 30 over 8 equals sine of, what was that big angle? 141, nope, 111.3 because I'm looking in triangle 1 
over uh, S1. Oh. Let me switch the ones and twos. Uh, over S1 and solve around. So I'm going to need to take the reciprocal of both sides and say this is 8 over sine 30 equals S1 over sine of 111.3. So I'm going to do 8 divided by sine 30, which should be 16, and times that by sine of 111.3 and get 14.9. So S1 is going to be 14.9 centimeters. Let's kind of check that. Does that make sense in this triangle that that long looking side between uh, 10 and 8 uh, or would be 14.9? I think that does. That makes sense, especially if it's across from an angle that's 111. And then let's solve for triangle 2. So to solve for that triangle 2, uh, I need to use that Y1 angle here. So again, I'll do 8 over sine 30 equals side 2 over sine of uh, 8.7. I'm going to multiply by sine of 8.7. 8 over sine 30 is just 16, just like before. And then times sine of 8.7. So you get about 2.42. We'll say 2.4. So S2 is around 2.4 so, Okay, so going back to look at this triangle all in one, uh, we were given the same information, 10, 8, and 30, but then everything else was different. This first triangle had two angles, 38.7 and 111.3, and a missing side of about 14.9, and the second triangle we saw for had two angles of 140 and about 8, and a missing side that was a lot shorter, and so we have sort of a large outer triangle and we have a smaller inner triangle and with the givens we were given we have no way of knowing which is which and since we don't know which is which we just solve for both uh, and and present that as our answer and we say here are the two possible triangles that could be created from this given information so at this point you might be saying okay well sure if I'm given a uh, angle side side situation I will always find two triangles and that's a lot of work, but it's also not true. There are further complications, and the further complications are that sometimes you only get one triangle and sometimes you get no triangles. So here are two situations where that flexible case is actually less flexible, less ambiguous. The first one is say that I was given a 30 degree angle. I'm using much of the same information. So I'm just gonna say that side is mysteriously long and I was given a 30 degree angle and a side of 10 centimeters right here. And then I was told that the opposite side to the 30 was 12 centimeters. Now, I could try to draw that 12 centimeters. It would look like it would probably fit all the way around out here. But if I tried to position the 12 centimeter side inside here to make another triangle, do you see how I would have a problem? I could not connect, and if I put the 12 centimeters right here, it wouldn't make a triangle at all. So like this is a situation where that 12 centimeter, if you imagine again that this is the center of a circle, it would be a badly drawn circle. If that 12 centimeters is the center of a badly drawn circle, there's only one potential place that it can connect and no other places will create a triangle. So if that was the case, you would end up creating just one triangle. And the specific reason is because 12 is greater than 10. Keep that in mind. Hmm, okay. Well, so I can watch out for situations like that, where the opposite side is longer than the adjacent side. But what if I was given this information? So here's kind of an adjacent side. I don't know how long it is yet. I was given, oh, I'm gonna draw that angle to scale. 30 degrees, 10 centimeters, 
and four centimeters. So four centimeters is only like, it's less than half of 10. So it's probably only about this long. So if I were to try to swing this side down, it would potentially, it would potentially not be long enough to create a triangle at all. And that's a third situation that can happen. Uh, in, in all the other situations, if I give you three pieces of data, you're guaranteed to make a triangle. But if I give you uh, data here, I could give you data that doesn't even make a triangle that makes sense. So how do we test for that? Well, what if I forgot about the four and instead just said, hey, what would the minimum length of this side be? Minimum. Well, the minimum length of that side, not four, would be whatever would make this a right angle, since uh, a perpendicular is the shortest distance between a point and a line. Well, how could I find this? Well, I guess I could use right triangle trig. This would be 10 sine of 30. Now, sine of 30 is 1 half, so this is 10 times 1 half, or 5. So in a situation like this where you're just given, like, if you were just given a 30 and a 10, you could actually sort of identify what's the minimum length that the other side would need to be to even make a triangle. And the minimum length here is five. And if there's, if the length here is five, I can make, I guess, exactly one triangle. Uh, I can make a right triangle. If that was a little bit longer, then I could start to make two triangles again. And if that was as long, like really long, then I could start to only make one triangle. So that's part of this ambiguous case being just very weird. So that's like a lot of data to put together. Um, I wanna try to give you kind of a flow chart of what you should do when you're given uh, some angle sides and told to solve for the triangle. So I'm gonna try to be as general as possible. Say that we're given some angle A. I'm gonna draw it out. I don't know how long that side is. I don't know exactly how big this angle is, but I'm just going to call it A degrees. And given sides B and A, now side B is the adjacent one, and A, little a, is always opposite big A, so that's uh, the way we think about A. The first thing I want to compute is the minimum possible length. So the minimum possible length is gonna be found by computing, by doing B times sine of big A. This will give you the height, is one way to think about it, and also the minimum length uh, for A to form triangles. So, that uh, lets us, if we check that height, it lets us rule out the no triangles case right away. If your opposite side is shorter than B sine big A, that is the minimum possible length, then you have no triangles can be made. Because you're in a situation like this, where you have a sad opposite side and it's dangling out there in space and it cannot connect. There's another situation here, uh, which is what if your opposite side is literally equal to the minimum that it could be? Well, then you have a right triangle because your a was directly equal to B sine A. And so you have one triangle and it just so happens to be a right triangle. Now, once you know it's a right triangle, I would recommend ditching the law of sines, ditching the law of cosines, just use the Pythagorean theorem to find everything you need. But let's say that I was not in one of those situations. Uh, let's say then that your A was greater than B sine A. 
And that's what's probably going to happen most of the time in these problems. Um, these two, you know, the no triangles and the right triangles, sort of like weird little special cases that happen sometimes. But most of the time you're going to be in this case right here. Uh, well, there's two situations here. So you've checked this. Then what you're going to do is check. Check. Is A larger than B or is A smaller than B? If A is smaller than B, then we're in a situation like I've drawn right here, where that side A can be positioned into two separate places. And so we can draw then two triangles. One obtuse and one acute, uh, both with the same given information. On the other hand, if A is larger than B, that kind of rules out that situation. And if I were to draw a larger A more to scale, that would be a situation kind of like this. If A is much larger than B, or not even much larger, as long as it's even a little bit larger than B, you will have one triangle and you can solve for it. So your one triangle will always kind of be a fat triangle to look like this. So there's actually four situations that you can have, and there's kind of this series of tests you go through. First, you compute the height and decide if a triangle can be made at all. If a triangle can be made, you have to compare the opposite side to the adjacent side and decide, are you in a one triangle case or a two triangle case? If you're in, uh, no matter what case you're in, you sketch it out and then just draw the triangles. Here's my advice to you. Always draw a picture. Always draw a picture. Not only that, but when you draw a picture, try your best. It doesn't have to be perfect, but try your best to make it to scale. Obviously, pictures can lie, but if you're making it to scale, it's really, really going to help you. Now, would a well-drawn picture be sufficient mathematical evidence? Would it be a substitute for computing and checking the height? Not at all. But a good picture is going to just help your brain sort of know what situation you're in. It's going to help you remember this. If you try to remember it as a, if you try to remember this as a series of equations like this, you're going to get lost. I guarantee it. So think about it instead as a series of geometry uh, kind of pictures and, and scale pictures that you're trying to draw. Now, I know this video has gone on for a really long time. Thank you guys for continuing to watch and stand with me here. I wanted to close with one more example just to put everything with that we talked about into practice. Uh, so say that I had a triangle with a 40 degree angle, then next to the 40, I had a 20 foot side, and then across from the 40, there was a 16 foot side. Uh, first, and our job was to solve this triangle, find all the possible angles and sides. Um, so let's first try to draw it out. There's the base. I don't know how long that is. Call that 40 degrees. Call that 20 feet. And before I draw this 16 foot, I'm going to do my tests. So the first thing I want to test is to compute the height, which is going to be found by doing uh, 20 sine of 40. about 12.9. So 12.9 is the smallest that a side could be for there to be one triangle, for there to be triangles at all. So 16 is greater than 12.9, and it's not equal to 12.9 either, which means I'm going to have either no triangles, no, that's a lie, I'm going to have either two triangles or one triangle. Now how do I check if I have two triangles versus one triangle? I now need to compare 16 to 20. So since 16 is smaller than 20, that's going to give me two possible locations for the 16. It could either live here or it could live here. Because it's smaller than 20, it could fit in either of those locations. So I know now that I'm going to have two triangles that I need to solve for. So, you know, I said, we went through that test. There's a lot of data. Doing this test is actually very quick, especially when you're sitting there with your calculator. 
It doesn't take a lot of extra work, but you really have to do it so that you know what situation you're in. Okay, let me clean up this picture a little bit and then we'll start solving for these uh, variables. So since I already tested the height, I'm gonna get rid of this, clean this out of the diagram. And let's start solving. So the first angle I'll solve for here, I'm gonna call x1. How do I find x1? Well, let's set up a law of sine. So I know that x1 Nope. Sine of x1 over 20 is going to equal sine of 40 over 16. So sine of x1 is going to equal 20 times the sine of 40 divided by 16. I can take the sine inverse of both sides and I'll just do that whole expression on my calculator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. get about 53 point, uh, we'll say 53.5. Let's go ahead and uh, solve for the entire triangle one up here. So I'm now gonna then solve for this large angle uh, that I'm calling Y1 by doing one eight to minus mm -hmm, minus 53.5 and get 86.5 so triangle one has 40 degrees 53.5 degrees 86.5 degrees it has 16 feet 20 feet and I have to solve for this last side we'll call this side one s1 so I can do a law of sines again. Uh, side one over sine of 86.5 will equal do 16 over sine 40. So sine one would be 16 over sine 40 multiplied by the sine of 86.5, uh, which is about 24.84. Approximately 24 by 8. That seems like a reasonable number given the picture. It looks like it's longer than the 20 and longer than the 16, so that sort of seems pretty reasonable. Alright, so that's all I needed to find for triangle 1. But now I'm going to try to find triangle 2. Now triangle 2 has angle... Well, I'm going to keep that 53. I'm going to get rid of this Y1 though, that doesn't actually help me. Now remember how we find angle x2. I know that this is isosceles, so this is 53.5 also, so then I can do 180 minus 53.5 and get 126.5. That's an angle. And then I can do 180 minus that, minus 40, and get 13.5 as the other missing angle. So in triangle two, I have a 40 degree, I have a 126.5 degree, and I have a 13.5 degree. Now, I need to find this missing side, S2, that's short over there. So again, let me set up a law of sines. We'll do S2 over sine of 13.5 equals 16 over sine 40. I'm using the 16 and 40 just because those were like in the givens. It's kind of nice to use things that were given to you. Um, that way you're not using things that you might have made a mistake on. Not that I think I made a mistake, but you never know. So I'm going to do uh, that 16 over sine 40 again. Have that up here somewhere. Times sine of 13.5. And we get about 5.8. So I've solved for all the missing sides and all the missing angles in triangle uh, two. The missing side was side two and the other two sides were given as 16 and 20 feet.
So here now I know everything there is to know about triangle of two. Uh, and here it is all on one screen. Now obviously these problems take kind of a while to do. Um, you have to do the test. If you're in the two triangle case, you then have two triangles to solve for. Uh, and you have to do, you know, a little bit of law of sines. I ended up, I think, doing law of sines three times here uh, to find an angle and then to find two sides. So it's a lot of solving. Just keep track of things, make pictures, make lists, organize. Uh, I actually really like color coding here, kind of doing one triangle in red and one triangle in blue. Um, and practice. Practice, practice, practice. It's going to get a lot faster and a lot better. So that is going to be it today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video on the weird little cases about law of uh, signs and when you're given uh, an angle aside and a side. That's all.